here tonight. My name is Kelly Schumann. I'm the Vice President for Human Resources at the School of Mines. And tonight, I'm excited for our talk, and I thank you for joining us. We have Dr. Brett Lingwell. He is the Associate Professor in our Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering on campus. And as you can see from the slide up here, he's going to speak to us about his research topic in learning about engineering from termites in nature. So I welcome Dr. Brett Lingwell to the stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Uh, uh, correction and retraction, I'm an assistant professor, not associate professor. That's okay. Hey, HR said it, you're an associate professor. <laughs> Dr. Jenner, did you hear that? It's been confirmed. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for attending this evening. I'm delighted to be here to talk about our research program that's going on here at the South Dakota School of Mines. Um, a few things first. I like to put the thank yous up first because they're important, and if they're at the end, we might run out of time. The first big thank you goes to Professor uh, Andrea Surovec, who, who is in the mechanical engineering department here at Mines, and is the, who is the mastermind of this whole, whole endeavor with the termite uh, bio-inspired research. We also have to give some very special thanks to Dr. Paul Bardinius, who is our termite biologist, who is based out of Florida. So he could not be here tonight. He lives in Miami. We couldn't convince him to be here at the city. Um, so this is uh, Dr. Surbeck, and then she's standing next to one of the uh, termite mounds in Africa that will be the subject of, of this evening's talk. Also, huge props to the National Science Foundation. We have received as a research group several grants from the CMMI, um, CMMI, which is in the engineering director of the National Science Foundation, and they have supported this work. Okay. About me, disclosure, I am an engineer. I am not a biologist. So when we do questions, please make them engineering -y, <laughs> rather than very specific to the biology, because I don't have Paul on the phone right now to answer the nitty gritty details of the biology. My background, um, I am a geotechnical engineer. Geotechnics is a um, division or a research area in civil engineering. Uh, my degrees are in civil engineering, and my research, when I was coming through the ranks and um, forming my program, was all in earthquake engineering. Um, the picture of me, that is taken from the town of, top of Mount Vittori, which is in central Italy. I was part of the 2016 National Science Foundation funded uh, recon mission to study the uh, faulting and the earthquakes that happened in 2016 in central Italy that destroyed several of the uh, iconic uh, townships and villages there in Italy. Um, and that was a picture that was taken by one of my um, paleoseismologist friends when we were studying the fault, which happened to be on top of the mountain. Um, all my research previous to coming, coming to the School of Mines had to do a lot with liquefaction. The, figure, the other figure there with the car, um, this, that was taken from the 2011 Christchurch, New Zealand earthquake. Uh, the car was on solid ground until the earthquake. The ground started, started to shake. The soil liquefied and the car fell in. After the earthquake stopped shaking, the ground re-solidified and the car was stuck. So that's kind of where my research really began. But since coming to, to the School of Mines, we've been looking at some different things, some more innovative uh, areas of research. And we, we decided to look as a program at nature as one of our sources for inspiration for our engineering systems. Now, why do we want to look at nature? Well, partly because it's cool and it's fun and it's interesting, which is why you're here. Um, we also want to look at nature because it's a great source of inspiration because nature is growing things and natural systems are building things. And as engineers and scientists and contractors and construction managers and everything we deal with in civil engineering, we are also building things. So there's a lot of uh, synergies there that we can look to. Another note, after Oh, give or take a few hundred million years of, of time, nature has, through evolution, been able to do a lot of tuning to its systems. Um, there's been tuning, there's been a lot of trials, there's been a lot of failed trials along the way, and, but there's been some great successes, and so we can learn from some of the optimization that's occurred from nature. And for me, the biggest thing is 
engineers and scientists, because we get so focused on our subject area, we tend to simplify things down to the basic set of concepts and principles and or analytical tools which we are comfortable with in our field of discipline. In other words, we like to simplify. We're always simplifying in the lab, we're trying and or in our calculations and our governing equations to simplify because that's how we can constrain the world and simplify models that can actually be solved. However, nature has no such luxury. Nature is complex. There are a lot of things going, there's a lot of balls in the air, if we're to use a juggling analogy, which is good because it forces us as researchers to also have to get out of our little silos and really work together with people with other expertise to understand complex problems, which as a rising tide raises all boats, raises science completely. I want to start with a few definitions. So biomimicry uh, is probably what people are most familiar with when we talk about learning from nature. So this is uh, some, some figures which were uh, provided by Professor Robert Full at the University of California at Berkeley. He's a biomimetics person. Uh, he's a biologist who works with a lot of robotics people. And this is what people are familiar with often. So we have some sort of an animal model. We study the animal. We simplify it down into some sort of a mathematical model. And then we build a physical model that replicates or mimics the natural behavior. And we're not looking at all the behaviors of the organism, we're looking at a few specialized behaviors. So in this figure, uh, Professor Full has been studying cockroaches and developing cockroach-inspired um, robots. Boston, uh, the Boston Ro Robotics, Boston Dynamics, I forget the name of the company, They're, they've been in the news a lot, they have a lot of these bio-inspired robots. So there's been a, a lot of bio-inspired engineering that's been in the field of robotics and mechanical engineering for a very long time. I'm not a robotics person, so I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in some other things. So bio-inspired engineering is a little bit different. In bio-inspired engineering, we look for what the fundamental principles that are governing behaviors in nature, and then we use those fundamental principles to inspire human-made systems. So this, uh, this work that I have on the screen here is from our colleague at Princeton University, Professor Sigurd A. Hansen. She does shape finding analysis, and what she's been working on lately is bio-inspired building facades. That that they've, they've studied flowers and leaves and how plants open and close, and are using those to divide to design smart building facades that can open and close and adjust to keep the sunlight at the right angle so you have enough light in the building, but not too much so the building doesn't overheat. So they've got these mechanical bio-inspired building facades. They're not mimicking exactly a natural behavior phenomenon, but they're drawing inspiration from them. Meanwhile, the United States Army Corps of Engineers and other organizations have been promoting the idea of engineering with nature. So engineering with nature is to use nature itself to do our engineering for us. So uh, a lot of the projects that the Army Corps of Engineers has been involved with in this idea of engineering with nature are to use things like the tides, um, rivers and channels to, uh, to fortify and restore coastal defenses and flood protection, restoring salt marshes and things, and things like that by inducing floods or um, putting sediment loads into, the, into rivers that can be then washed downstream and using natural processes to do the work for us. Um, we have some of, we have work in the engineering in nature's way on campus in our um, civil engineering department. A lot of the work that's been done by uh, Dr. Cherry Wright with his compost research is in using natural processes to engineer better hydrological systems. So this is some, this is a type of research which we're doing here at the School of Mines. We're not related to the coast, but probably the, the one people are familiar with. We also have what we call bioengineering. So I'm an infrastructure person, so we are bioengineering infrastructure. So uh, I have a wonderful PhD student, Tasha Hodges. She's been working on um, this project for several years using a certain strand of bacteria, uh, Sporosorcina pasteuri. We culture the bacteria, and it's a very targeted uh, strain of bacteria. We combine it with the right chemicals. We feed it the right stuff. We put it in the ground between sand particles, and the bacteria produce a urease enzyme. They're urolytic bacteria, and the urease reacts with calcium to form calcite. Um, the urease enzymes are very good at producing a bio-cement and cementing the soil grains together. 
So one of the things we're working on in our lab right now is biosemics, where we have some sort of a biomineralization process using bacteria, fungi, um, and other microorganisms to do cement in the ground. A lot of this work was pioneered by Professor Song Shilin Suki Bing, um, who were legends, research legends here at the School of Mines. Um, so those are some different definitions. Okay, all that out of the way. I have a question. Is nature a perfect source of inspiration? Well, as I use the word perfect, you probably, you're probably guessing no. Yes. Nature is not a perfect source of inspiration. There are some good reasons for that. Natural systems often have different performance objectives than what we need in human systems. Um, animals don't have to, often have to live for 50 years in a, in a domicile or dwelling of some kind. Their structures may be more transient and or may be far more permanent than human structures. Um, natural systems have different risk tolerances than human society. In natural systems, there may be very high tolerance for loss of life because the purpose is to keep the species going, right? To, to continue the species and that may cost a lot of individual organisms. Well, in human systems, we don't like that. We have very low risk tolerance. We don't like saying it's acceptable to have X percent of the population die. That's just, it makes us really uncomfortable. There's, you know, we don't like it. So we have some different risk tolerances and performance objectives. The other problem is nature is stuck with the evolutionary history that came before it. So certain evolutionary steps brought things to a certain point, and so there's some baggage associated with that past. There may have been some mistakes made along the way that the system is blind to, and the system may be blind to future changes. So here's the disclaimer. Uh, this is as uh, Robert, uh, Professor Robert Philip Berkeley has rephrased what Jacob uh, stated in 1977. Evolution is not engineering. It's not. Evolution is tinkering. Now tinkering is really never knowing about what the end product will be and using everything at one's disposal to find something that works, um, which is not engineering. So we have to be careful when we say we're learning by engineering because we're learning engineering principles and how to engineer systems and things, but evolution is not engineering. Just a, a, few, a few things. Um, Trade-offs. Trade-offs are the rule in nature. Um, Things have to be sacrificed. There are severe constraints, and things are very rarely global, optimized for a global situation. Can you, how many organisms do you, can you think of that are optimized to live everywhere on the planet? <laughs> Humans, because you know, we have these amazing brains. And that's uh, plankton, I don't know, they're krill, I and mean, there's a few, but they're very limited. Um, so it's not perfect. Now, the fundamental problem of interest, why we're looking at termites. The problem is diesel fuel. Modern civilization floats on an absolute sea of this stuff. Modern civilization runs on diesel fuel. It takes a massive amount of diesel to build anything we're building. We talk about Portland cement concrete and steel. Well, it takes a massive amount of diesel fuel to mine, extract the raw materials, to process those raw materials, to transport those materials to some sort of a plant where the where Portland cement concrete or structural steel are, are made, to transport those to a distribution center, to get them to your site, to get them built from your site into your building or whatever your infrastructure system is. It's an amazing amount of diesel fuel that fuels the system. Um, lumber, amazing amount of diesel fuel. Pretty much everything we use is for construction, for infrastructure, requires a just huge amounts of diesel fuel to get it to a site. Diesel fuel is very efficient, we do a lot of bang for our buck, but it's not going to last forever. So we're trying to find options here where we can use something from nature as a new building material that does not require large amounts of diesel fuel to get the materials to the site and to get the thing built. So termites. So termite mound from Africa, this is a stock photo. You can see how big these mounds are, taller than a giraffe. These are massive structures, and they're built without an ounce of diesel fuel. So knowing 
30, 40, 50, 100 years, I don't know when the diesel is going to run out or get very scarce, but it will eventually. It's just how things work. Things, you know, resources, they become depleted and it will we'll need alternatives. So we can look at alternative fuels, alternative energy sources, alternative energy storage, which is part of the problem and part of the solution, excuse me. The other part of the solution is finding new ways to do things in society that don't require that useful fuel. So we want to study how the termites are doing this, what they're building, what keeps it up, so we can learn about new building materials. So this big structure is built by small insects. Pretty amazing stuff. And it is tough. It is hard. So termites. The termites have a very complicated uh, family tree. Here's a bit of biology for you. A uh, little known fact, a termite is very closely related to a cockroach. Uh, termites are very old. You can see that um, much of their evolutionary history comes from the Mesozoic era. era. Much of the branching here in the tree comes in the Cretaceous, the era of dinosaurs, the T-Rexes, the Triceratops. That's how ancient m many of these species are. Now, the termites are divided into two um, groups. There's the lower termites, and the higher termites. The lower termites are ones we are perhaps more familiar with here in North America that crawl along the basement and chew the wood and um, make little things up the side of one's house along the foundation. Um, where the higher termites are the ones we are interested in. And we are interested in the macro termites, the macro termites there. And there are thousands of species, thousands of species to choose from. Um, termites are spread any tropical, subtropical area. Termites are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. Uh, you may not see them, but they are there. Our site is in Namibia because in Namibia we have a lot of these really great mound builders. So, termites are not ants. They're closely related to cockroaches. They have many of the same behaviors, many of the same appearances. Uh, they have Ants have queens, termites have queens. Ants live in colonies, termites live in colonies. They're about the same size. They both have soldiers. Um, there's workers. I mean, there's, there's a lot of similarities, but it is convergent evolution. They are not close, closely related to one another. Um, some of your lower uh, termites are the ones who are, are, are eating wood and digesting the cellulose themselves. However, the ones we're interested in, these ones who build these big mounds, these are fungus-eating bacteria, or bacteria, fungus-eating termites. What they do is they scavenge for cellulose sources, wood, plant, vegetable matter. They take it into the mound, and they put it on a fungus. The fungus grows on the, the vegetation that they bring into the mound. The fungus di does the, the digestion in water, you know, like digests all that lignin and cellulose and all that tough stuff for them, and then the termites eat the fungus. So we are looking at fungus farming termites. Now there are fungus farming ants, yes, but it's convergent evolution. The other reason we like termites is because they are builders rather than just tunnelers. Where ants are tunnelers, termites are building. So this is our, um, a picture of our field site for, uh, provided by a PhD student, Hannah Mullen, who's here in the audience tonight. Um, so if you look at the image, there's a termite mound, 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 there's a termite mound. Off screen, there's a termite mound, there's a termite mound, they're everywhere. So, our field site is really great because the farmers, the property owners, if we have to cut one open, they're like, yeah, go cut one open. Um, the environmental permitting, because they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere, um, it's really convenient. Uh, we have to thank the Cheetah Conservation Fund, um, you know, Achi. Uh, Achi, Namibia, um, which is where we do a lot of our field work, and we're, um, we were just there in May, and we're going back in December, and then we'll be back in next May for, a, for uh, these field trips to go study the termite now. So you can see the country, it's very open. There's, you know, there's trees here and there, um, but it's not heavily forested, which makes it really nice for research, and we don't have to, to whack a lot of vegetation out of the way to get to our, the termite mounds and study them. So the macro termites, which are our, our subject species, they're pretty small. So this image, this is looking down in a 12-inch diameter tube of uh, uh, soil that the termites are building inside of. Um, you can see the little white dots. Those are the termites. They're, 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 they are quite small. Um, 
they're small. And so they're, they're building in this tube, and you can see kind of the structure of what they're building. It's got kind of got this spongy look to it while they're building. It's really remarkable uh, to think that these little, little creatures are going through a tunnel, whether at the ground surface or below the ground, sampling a little bit of soil, taking it in their mouth, mixing with their saliva, bringing it up into the mound, and placing it. And then they go back and they get another one. They go back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, all day every day. They're always building. They are always, if they're not, if they're not up searching for um, wood or you know, cellulose or different things to, to give to the fungus, they're building. They're always building. Um, one of the science questions we are trying to ask with our research program is, where are they getting the water? Because every little clump of soil they take to build, is used, they're using their saliva. So they're using a lot of water every single day to build, all day, every day, all year long. Where are they getting the water from? And of the available water choices, which water are they choosing? So that's some of our ongoing experiments right now is, because it's important for us to know, is there a certain chemistry in the water they're, they're sampling? Are they attracted to one water that has a certain type of mineral in it? Or do they just go get any type of water that they can? So the results aren't in yet, we're still working on that. The mounds, um, the mounds like we, we showed in the previous, they can get quite large. Um, they, they tend to have this, this talus at the, at the bottom of the mound because in the rainy season, or when idiot researchers come along and knock them open, or when an elephant bumps up against it or something, there's gonna be debris, stuff will fall off, gravel off in the intense monsoons. So there's material down at the base, but then the termites are always building and improving the mound. Now the mound itself is not where the termites live. The termites live in a nest. Now the nest is below the ground surface. So you can see the native ground surface. So the termites are living down under there. They have a network of tunnels that's extending out into the field, and then they have this big mound over top. The mound is for the fungus. It's not for the termites. It's for the fungus. The termite colony can survive without the mound. However, the mound is essential for regulating the environmental conditions that are optimal for their farm. They are fungus farmers. They are modifying their environment to optimize the growth of their primary food source, which is the fungus. So the mound itself acts as protection for the fungus. It acts as a temperature regulation device. It acts as a humidity regulation device. Some of the things we don't know. We don't know why the termites are, uh, why they're building it bigger, or opening holes, or doing whatever they're doing on any given day. The hypothesis is, is that the fungus is giving some sort of a signal to the termites, but we don't know what that signal is, how it's communicated, we don't understand it. And it's the hypothesis right now. But what we do know is this thing is to protect the fungus. It's all about the fungus. So the building process is really interesting. So we have three figures, A, B, and C. Figure A is when they're building a new area. Now the, the termites, because they are, there's so many of them, living in a small space, 10, 15, 20 million organisms in a single colony. For all of them to have a really hard cuticle on the outside of their body like an ant has would be a lot of energy and a lot of resources. So the termites have outsourced body protection from the sun, they've outsourced that to the mouth. So they can't work out in the sunshine. They have to have an enclosed area to do their work in. So what they'll do to protect themselves from the sun is they start, they build a shell. And once they have the shell built, they start to scaffold in the inside. So they go from the shell to the scaffolding on the inside. That's this spongy, spongy look. The term that they use is spongy build. Sometimes scientists aren't that creative. It looks like a sponge, we're gonna call it spongy. It's spongy. So we have the spongy build. The spongy build has more structure, but it's not strong enough, nor does it have the required properties for the thermal regulation, the protection, the humidity regulation, all these other uh, purposes that the mound material is uh, using. And so they slowly fill in the sponge until you have a more solid material that has discrete tunnels moving through it. So they're, they, they kind of build a dome, then they fill in the dome, and then when they need to build more, they expand the dome, they expand the dome, and they expand the dome, whether it's going out or up, that's what they're doing. 
So it's an interesting building process. So we have some colleagues at Harvard that are studying the building process and the swarming and the, the swarming, uh, how are they communicating with, with each other in the swarm. That's what um, the, some of those colleagues are studying. We're studying the material itself. So the material, okay, here's your requisite science graphs. My boss expects to see science, so here's the science. We've got graphs and numbers. I promise I won't have an equation. Uh, so the material, it has a certain stress. So this is a stress strain curve. Stress being how strong it is, strain, the amount of displacement to lock, to lock in that stress. So we know that if we were low to push on it, it reaches a peak and then it drops off. Um, what we're studying right now is the contributions of that strength from the biocementation, from the biocement. We don't know what's causing the biocement. We don't actually know what biomineralization process is being used yet. Yet, Hannah's figuring that out for us. But we know that there's a contribution from the biocement. We know that there's a, a component to the strength from what we call capillary tension or matrix suction. Capillary tension is the idea that if you have a very, very small, thin tube and you put a little water in it, the surface tension of the water will pull up on the sides of the tube. You, you see this when you've had wicking materials, you've seen like paper wick up water. Wicking is capillary tension drawing water up into a material that, is, that has air in it. If you start to dry the material out, that capillary tension starts working the other way and it acts like a suction. So we know that as the termites start, they build this, it's wet, they put it on the wall, and then it starts to dry out. And as it dries out, the clay in there starts to harden up a little bit. And so the matrix suction starts to develop, and based on the water contents we've measured inside the mound, which are about 15%, 50% water content for the materials, we're getting something like 800 to 900 kPa of tension between each one of the soil particles. Probably don't have a sense of what that means. It's strong. It's a brick. That's what that means. So to make a brick, you take clay, you fire it, you lock in that matrix suction, and you vitrify the clay particles so that they won't re-wet, and you've got this amazing strength. So the termites are doing that without having to fire it in an oven, which is pretty cool. Um, we we take a what we do is we take slices of the mound, um, we fill the the voids with this white plaster. Uh, we can fill the zinc or you know, all sorts of things, but in this case, plaster. And we can start to look at the material itself. We're going to look at the voids. We're also going to look at the material. So we're, we're starting to understand this amazing strength. And it's like a brick. It really is like a brick. Um, to cut these things open, we need a concrete chainsaw. Um, we tasked Hannah with taking you know, a pick and hammer, and she came back from Africa really strong. <laughs> These things are hard. Um, so to, to study the material, we need to know that understand the source material. So we've been digging test pits adjacent to the to the, to the mounds and taking the soil that has not been put in a mound, and we we're, we're working with Namibian University of Science Technology collaboratively um, on the materials testing for the for the soil that's in the field around around the mound. So our mound is in this tree right here. It's that black shape right there. And then we have a test pit which is being dug. Um, and there, there, that's Paul, our termite biologist. Um, Hannah was taking this picture, and then she jumped down in the hole. But we gave very good safety protocols, because we didn't want the hole to collapse on her. So she was safe. We took care of her. I don't like killing my PhD students. It's bad for business. Um, so we're taking the material here, we're testing it, we're trying to find the properties of the untreated, and then we have samples of the mound that are here that we can study that have been treated. And we can get a really good comparison of what's going on for the material. When we look at the pore structure, we can do some really fun things. So one of the things we can do is we can cut these things open and we can um, take a mound that's abandoned, the colony's no longer active, or it's, it's in trouble, it's stressed. We can maybe cut the top off, turn the top over, and pour molten zinc down inside. The molten zinc follows the pores, the macro pores, and fills them up. Then you can just sandblast the tunnels that are being used in here. So what we're doing with these is we are doing 3D digital scans, and then we are transferring those into mathematical models. 
So this is a simplified mathematical model. And what we're doing is we're trying to understand the airflow, the heat flow, the, the flow of humidity in the, the tunnel, and in the tunnel as it comes in and it swirls around as it comes out, because there's an amazing amount of heat generated by 20 million organisms. Termites are small, but 20 million of them, they're generating a lot of heat. That heat has to get out somehow. We know it goes up the, the mound, but the mound lacks doors, or windows, or vents, or thermal exhaust ports, or anything like that. So the heat is coming out through the mound material itself. So what we're doing is we're taking these casts, we're doing 3D digital models, and we're putting them in multi-physics simulations to understand the thermal flow. But to do that, we have to understand the role of the multi-scale porosity on the heat exchange, on the airflow exchange, on the humidity exchange. So what we're doing is we're, we're studying the porosity from the macro level pores, which are the tunnels, to the meso level pores, which are the cool cracks, to the micro scale pores, which are the individual clods of soil that have been mashed together and the pores between the individual clods. And then within an individual clod of soil, we're looking at the space between the mineral particles themselves, all scales. So taking a sample this big, and we're using like six different types of microscopes to study the different, different pores. What we can do is we can use things like uh, three-dimensional micro CT scanning to do 3G, 3D mapping of the macro, and meso, and micro um, porosity to study those. Um, this, this scan was performed by Hannah yesterday, I think, um, showing where the black is. These would be some of the, the micro pores on a small uh, two, probably a one centimeter sample of the material. So we're doing 3D mapping of the material and we're doing all sorts of thermal tests and trying to really understand the, the heat flow and the heat exchange. Our other PhD student, Tasha Hodges, has been tasked with understanding the bio cement. Now, Tasha is really good with bacteria and she can take certain types of bacteria, she can put them in soil, she can give them the right food and they will biomineralize. So this is some samples she ran with some bacteria, not the African bacteria, um, but some American bacteria that are related to the bacteria we're finding in the, in the termite mounds. Um, sequencing African bacteria turns out to be a difficult thing, so we're relying on U.S. cultures. Um, so, so we're working on the bio cement. So these are two sand, uh, samples of sand that have been biomineralized, they've been cemented, and these little holes are penetration tests to see how hard it is. And we, we get some pretty good strengths, just like they, uh, they are getting there in Africa. Um, we're learning so much about engineered systems from nature. Um, we've been working recently with Colorado State University and Princeton University on understanding natural systems, not just organisms, but systems. Because there's some amazing parallels between how a natural system responds to a stressor and is resilient as a human community is resilient. So we're looking at the multi-scales of natural resilience to things like wildfires and earthquakes and disease and some things, and using those lessons to model human, uh, human community response. They respond very similarly. Um, we've developed, um, led by uh, our colleague, a Colorado State professor, Hussam Muhammad, it's called FEAR, the Finite Element Analysis of Resilience. So what we're doing is we're, we're applying this, this modeling framework to natural systems to understand natural system response, calibrating it to make sure we understand it, and then applying it to human communities, and looking at how human communities respond to the same and or different stresses on the community. Find some really interesting things. Um, last thought, complex. These problems are really complex um, in nature, and research going forward, the great lesson I learned from doing this research is how complicated things can really, really be. On our termite project, we have termite biologists, and microbiologists, and ecologists, and structural engineers, material science folks. We have um, the doctor of dirt, myself. We have meteorologists. We have people from all these different fields. We have collaborators from the US, and Australia, and Britain, and Namibia. And we're all coming together to look at these really complicated things. The more I look at engineering, the more I see how 
problems are complex. We have people are nested in systems and places. This is a figure uh, from a uh, social science researcher at Colorado State, Jennifer Cross, Professor Jennifer Cross. It's helping us and National Science Foundation and researchers and nationwide understand how, you know, in the end, people are really important to everything we research. We can learn a lot from nature and we can learn a lot about the built environment, but unless we understand the human component and the human element, it's all neat. But the rubber meets the road and the impact is made when people are using and understanding what we're doing, which is why it's nice to be here to be giving this talk. Um, eventually, we're going to have a material, we're going to want to use it in people's houses. It's going to require people to buy in on a termite based brick. You know, it's going to be something new and different. People are going to have to buy it and use it in their buildings eventually for this research to make any part of an impact. So, parting thought. Um, these are really amazing structures. They're built without an ounce of diesel fuel. The goal is to be able to develop a bio-inspired building material that can vent, as well as the termite mount can vent, can keep the water out, can keep the rain out, but let the humidity out at the same time as it's venting, protect us, require no diesel fuel, using only locally sourced raw materials, that'll last. So the thing we have to figure out, once we figure out what the termites are doing, is making it last. Because that's our, our burden, is to make this material last 100 years. The termites, they don't live 100 years, so they don't need it to last that long. So that's gonna be the next step for us. That is our challenge, once we learn what nature is doing. So, um, with that, um, open it up for questions. I'm getting the, uh, the cut off. <laughs> for us to study are in Africa. But they're the same species and or related species are in Australia, South America, Asia. Um, we have uh, sites in, in India um, that where we study the termite mountain. Professor Surovec, uh, when she kicked this thing off, she didn't go to Africa first, she went to India. India was the first stop. Um, we've been working with colleagues on, on different termite species in Australia that build some very differently shaped mounds, but have some very interesting thermal regulation properties. Um, Paul, our biologist, he has research sites that he's been working on in South America. Anywhere that is tropical or subtropical, you have termites, including the, the higher order um, fungus farming that are building mounds. They're, they really are except for here because, you know, it freezes in the winter here. So, termites can't live in Rapid City, South Dakota very easily because the ground freezes. Um, but if the ground doesn't freeze, there's termites. Yes? You've talked about weight or uh, heat. What about waste? How do they deal with waste? Well, you know, fungus eats waste. Well, I mean, uh, termites. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The fungus. Yeah, the fungus. They just recycle it into their food process. Yeah, the process. The termite mound itself has, the, the ecosystem that exists in there is really fascinating. It's the interplay between the insects, the fungus, and the various microbes in the biofilm. So every tunnel is lined with a biofilm of bacteria and other fungi and amoebas and all sorts of microorganisms and then microarachnids and different things are in this wonderful biofilm that lines the tunnels. And it's a really complicated symbiotic relationship that we don't understand like at all. But some things we do know, the termite colony has amazing disease resistance. The individual organisms can get sick, but the colony has amazing disease resistance. They, the colonies very rarely get, get sick and die from some sort of a pathogen. We don't know why. There is some anti-pathogen property there in the ecosystem yet to be discovered. In an area like in Namibia, are the towers, is there like a ratio that's constant of 
height to the base of the tower? They come in all sorts, sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, depends on the building material at hand. Um, to the south of where uh, this site is, the soil is a little sandier, and so they get a little more um, bulbous. They're a little more like squat. Uh, to the north of this site, where there's um, the right chemistry in the soil, they can be very tall and slender. In other cases, they're more cone-shaped. Um, the, the conditions are perfect in some of the, uh, especially in India, there's some really great conditions for these cathedral style, where there's multiple spires and multiple towers. Um, it really just depends on what's there for them to build with and or any you know, elephants trying to use this as a scratching post. So it's a little more variable than that. I wish there was though. Because it would make my life a lot easier if there was a nice ratio to these. The internal structure and the size of it in the large tunnel sounds like a micro. Got me to thinking about the, the change, my new changes in pressure and how that would enable moisture to be taken right out of the air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so this, it's saturated in the first few millimeters, and then it dries out as it comes to the top. But as they build it bigger, they need more and more water. The air keeps coming in. The air keeps coming in. So this is a desert. The other side of that was that, like leaves, you know, they have the micro. Yeah. So the termites, the termites do that seasonally. So in the wet season, they alter their mound differently than in the dry season. So they're se they seasonally adjust. It is. So people thought for a while that oh that even like the sunny side versus the shady side would have differences. Uh, I think we've, we're we're looking into that. We haven't really found anything to 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 prove that hypothesis that there's a hot side versus a cold side difference. But we do know if we do a cast, one of these Z casts in the, now where was it? One of these Z casts in the wet season versus the dry season, you'll get differences. And if it's a really dry season versus a really wet season, you can get some really big differences because they have to take their tunnels and reorganize them to get the right airflow for the right environmental conditions. It's, a, it's an active material. It's hard, they assemble it, they disassemble it, and that's pretty cool. Is there another question? For that, I would need my termite biologist. <laughs> I'm going to admit defeat. I don't have an answer to that. I'm, so that's why I have a biologist on the team who knows the answer to that, because when we do our peer-reviewed publications, he's there to jump in. And that's why I know, and, and no, multidisciplinary and what we call convergent research is really important because I can't know everything. Um, Hannah, who's our PhD student, she's not a civil engineer, she's a material science student. Her background is in metals and ceramics and materials, which is what we need for this project. Um, and we have the true biologist, and Tasha, she's a micro, she has a background in microbiology and water and physics. I'm pulling her, her in. So long story short, I don't have an answer for you, though I wish I did. Before the next presentation, I'll keep that in mind and I'll figure it out. Because <laughs> it's bound to come up again. Yes? So, we started off with that picture of the car being up to the soil by the earthquake. Do we have any idea how earthquake resistant these phenomena are? We don't. But we will by the end of this project. <laughs> Coming attraction. <laughs> come back in two and a half years. So that's, you know, that's on the table to study. Once we have our multi-physics models of the porosity, we will put them in finite element analyses. We will start loading them up. The plan is to do some full-scale load tests on these in Africa next year, where we're going to push on them and put some pretty big loads on them to understand the structural response a lot better. Um, and then we can do the, the simulations with the material and the loads, and we can really start to hone in on 
what kind of loading conditions these things are more robust to. Um, right now, we can tell that they're hard. They're hard to drill into. I mean, they're, but as far as like earthquake loads, that's an unanswered question. So it evolves over time, it has to change. Because as they have to change the macro porosity for the environmental conditions to keep their fungus happy, it's strengthening, it's weakening, it's changing. It's changing. Which is why when we're studying the studying the, the different levels of, so we have to study this level, but we also have to study, study the smaller level because this is gonna be far less impacted by day-to-day -day activity in the mound than the macro because they're fiddling with the macro all the time. So that's why we're looking at the meso scale. And then the micro scale, things that are independent of any activity they're doing at any given time. That's one of the things we're trying to figure out right now. We do know that the outside of the mound is stronger than the inside because it's drier on the outside than it is on, on the inside. Um, however, the strength on the inside is much higher than the material that you could get from the ground outside and walk together and compact together. It's, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 times stronger than anything you could get from the native material without some sort of chemical additive. Okay, well thank you very much.